Good morning, my name is Carrie Barnum and I am the Executive Director of New Shelves Books. And today I'm so excited and honored to have Amy Collins here. Amy is a literary agent with Talcott Notch. And of course we know Amy because Amy used to run Free Advice Fridays. So it is so fun to have you back, Amy, and we're excited. But first, before we jump right in, I know everyone wants a quick update. So what's been going on in life and what are you doing over at Talcott Notch? Uh, life, I miss, I miss everyone at New Shelves. I really do. But I have to say being an agent really, it's a, it's a great fit. Um, my life now as a literary agent, I, um, I help my clients get deals. I am constantly looking for, uh, editors and publishing houses and movie houses and audio houses where I can work a deal for my clients and I, um, you know, two weeks ago, I was driving around England and Scotland just meeting with editors. And three weeks before that, I was, you know, in Manhattan and I teach classes now for Writer's Digest and for other places. And I love it. My life is great, but I do miss new shelves. I miss the people there. And um, it's a very different side of the publishing industry, but it's the publishing industry and I, I'll never leave it. I'm, it's not like I, I can ever retire or leave it. <laughs> yes, I know. And so all of you here, it's probably really fun for Amy to come back and you to see her. But Amy and I actually, we text almost every day. So Amy and I still talk all the time. So it's fun to have you back. We have lots of questions, both in our Q&A and we got questions over by email. So we're going to jump right in because I know that we want to pick your brain with everything. Um, one of the questions that came up first was from Jessica. And the question here was about um, if chiclet is still a viable market with the popularity of romantic comedy kind of going broad, um, is chiclet still a viable market? Yes, but we don't call it chiclet. We don't call it chiclet. Um, there's a lot of words we don't use anymore uh, because we've grown as a society and there's a lot of words in our industry we don't use anymore. And people find chiclet to be um, demeaning or diminutive. So um, it's rom-com, it's romantic comedy. Uh, it's not called chiclet. And now there are subgenres, uh, and one that's very popular right now is romantic comedy with a touch of magic, a touch of speculative is very popular right now. Um, but, you know, thinking like all those Hallmark Christmas movies where there's an angel, that's, you know, just a touch of magic. Very, very popular right now. Chiclet has never had um, more opportunities, just don't call it chiclet. Perfect. Good to know. Um, and also we're getting questions. I know kind of this new theme of either having an animal's perspective or novels, literary novels, especially that are like from an animal's perspective or are written as an animal, kind of that thought process. Do you think that's something that's going to stick around? What are your thoughts on that one? Oh, if I, if I knew that I, 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 I could retire. I mean, I, I'm afraid there's no, there's absolutely no way of knowing how long it'll last. I do know that a lot of people are doing it. Um, and like any trend, I, uh, our industry loves it. They love a trend, but it has to be the same, but different. Um, so if you're writing a book, uh, from the point of view of an animal, please don't make it a dog standing in the rain. Um, you know, be unique, have a different take on things. The, um, the idea of a man's life told through the point of view of his pet has been done. So yes, I think there's room for it, but I, I think you better come up with something unique, something with a twist. And I don't mm -hmm. mean, I don't mean a murder. There's a lot of dogs are cats solving mysteries. By twist, I mean something new that that adds to the genre. Mm -hmm. Something fresh. I know um, a, a client and friend of mine, Barb Hinsky, she has kind of a book that very much involves the dog's point of view. However, it's a seeing eye dog. So it's that little twist of something a little bit different in learning how to be a seeing eye dog. And so it's those little kind of details that take something that could almost be overdone and make it new and exciting again, I think. Exactly. 
Um, speaking of trends, do you have any um, predictions or are you seeing any trends knowing that in self-publishing often we kind of stick in the here and now, what's going right now, but in traditional publishing, you tend to have to um, see out a little bit further with traditional publishing, often books, you're selling them two years before they actually go to market. So are you seeing any trends or do you have any predictions of what may be hot on the market in the next year or two? Well, I don't need to be Kreskin to give you that. Um, all you need is a publisher's marketplace subscription. See, I spend, uh, publisher's marketplace is, um, is, is a place where editors and agents meet online and they announce deals that they've signed. And it, it's got far more than that. Um, if, if anyone's ever looking to find out what's happening in, in nine months, nine, um, nine months, 18 months, 36 months down the road, just hop on and get a publisher's marketplace subscription. Um, so I can tell you because I am pouring over the deals. The deals are being signed right now. A lot of deals are being signed right now. And this is not gonna surprise you guys, but celebrity chefs and food cookbooks are still very hot right now. Um, and so, but you have to, I, I just signed a, a cookbook deal. Uh, and I, I didn't have any cookbook clients, but I saw the cookbooks were becoming very hot. So, you know, I, I called a, somebody and got a, a cookbook client. Um, so cookbooks are very hot right now. When it comes to fiction, a lot, a lot of, I can tell you more what's not selling right now. I got to tell you, um, thrillers and, and historical fiction and World War II, uh, I, I say plucky heroines fighting the Nazis. Um, not right now. They're not doing a lot. So what's happening a lot in fiction is reality things that are set in the 90s and the early 2000s. Not, I'm not talking about 9-11. When I say reality, I mean, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of, of recent history being written and, and, and being published. Uh, maybe it's the, it's the Sex in the City sort of look back, you know, a whole bunch of Gen Xers. Um, uh, a whole bunch of Gen Xers are looking back on their youth. So that's very popular. Um, LGBTQ stories that are taking place now. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm seeing a lot, a lot of stories being signed that are taking place in the modern world that are true literature, that are not commercial fiction. Commercial fiction is still doing really well, don't get me wrong. But romance and mysteries, they are going more and more to uh, to houses like Kensington and Bookature and places that do a lot of ebooks. And, mm -hmm. and if you're looking for that breakout debut novel, um, uh, there's a million things that are happening, uh, that too many to name. But I would tell you that, that if you've written a current novel that um, in current times mm -hmm. uh, and that embraces current themes, um, it's doing a lot better at the moment than history. That being said, I'm going to throw in there, Gold Rush, late 1800s, California, Southwest, doing very well right now, probably because of the popularity of the Yellowstone and 1883. Yeah. Um, uh, so Quirky is doing very well. Uh, uh, Gold Rush Times is doing very well. The 90s are very hot right now. Um, in terms of what's going to happen in the future, I'm betting a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm putting a lot of my money on sci-fi fantasy. Um, I, I believe that the next five years, sci-fi and fantasy is going to keep growing. And, and it's becoming more and more popular. However, that genre fiction, which means the deals aren't as big. You know, I'm not getting $20,000 advances. Um, I'm getting $2,000 advances. But they're getting sold. So I like it. Right, right. Well, and if they sell a lot, then of course, once you earn out that advance, you've got royalty opportunities if you're traditional. So that's great. Um, a question, and I know that you're not um, a children's book literary agent, but uh, Pat's asking about children's books. It seems like a lot of agents are closed for children's book pitches. Have you seen that trend? Are children's books still selling? Or are people really just sticking to their tried and true authors for that genre right now? 
children's books are absolutely selling. Um, right now, it is um, it is so competitive. Um, I've I've got a couple children's books as authors, and let me tell you what I'm hearing. I'm hearing, oh my gosh, this was a beautifully written story, and I love the theme about learning to you know lean into your strengths. But there's a million books out there about about, you know, just uh, honoring your own strengths and not worrying about, you know, what other people think, or this is a wonderful book and I just love it. But, um, you know, we're not doing picture books right now. We're doing, you know, or this early reader, this early reader is fantastic, but I already have three early readers that I find. it's, there's so much of it. Of course it is still selling, but mm -hmm. everybody's writing. It just feels like like everybody's writing a children's book and there are, and for picture books in particular, there are so many, there are so many rules that people aren't paying attention to. Word count. Um, uh, there's a woman that I recently started working with. Her name's Elizabeth Law from Holiday House. And she does, um, she does consulting on the side. And I hired her for a couple of hours teach me more about children's books because I couldn't figure out why my ch clients children's books weren't selling they were great stories she was like they're great stories but they all rhyme she goes you can't rhyme that's the people don't want that now she said rhyming children books she goes uh, you can sell them but they have to be pristine they have to be perfect do you have any idea how rare it is she said to find someone who can create a rhyming children's book now this, this is directly from her mouth I'm not saying this but it's so hard to find someone who can create a rhyming children's book that every line is perfect. Every, nothing's awkward, nothing's forced in. It, it, it trips off the tongue. Everyone reads those lines the exact same way. I mm -hmm. mean, if you get three different uh, people reading your book out loud, they're all gonna stumble or change. She said, all of that has to be true. She said, so don't, don't submit any rhyming children's books. I didn't know that. So yeah, kids' books are tough. Yeah, and I think we're seeing a lot of cause marketing and the cause writing where um, children's books are definitely becoming more diverse, I've noticed, which is fantastic. But that's what a lot of publishing houses seem to be looking for is not just the run of the mill, finding your own internal strength, but actually celebration of different heritages, different colors, different peoples, and actually celebrating that more because that's not something that's traditionally been um, published as much. And I think definitely schools and teachers and libraries are looking more and more to expand their collections to really be more inclusive. And I've noticed that um, with sales in particular, with direct sales there. That is true. Um, that is true. But the traditional publishing world is not, they're not looking for any books. If, if they involve inclusive um, themes, those need to be organic and part of the story no one's looking to be preached to nobody at this point nobody is buying books that tell kids that they have to feel a certain way what they do is they tell amazing stories that may shift a child's perception a bit but that's not the point of the story if you know hitting me over the head with a bag of nickels uh with the you know point of the story point of the story point of the story is not going to get you a deal now i just saw a comment from bob Eckstein. That is a book I would sign, but only if the slow cooker book for cats, if the cats are in the slow cooker, I don't want the cats cooking for themselves. I want a cat cookbook the way I'd want a chicken cookbook. I hope that's okay, Bob. So as long as that doesn't offend anyone, I'm in. Yeah. And we all have heard about that Netflix show. Don't sleep with cats. So <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Um, yeah, so I think that's great. And I think that's all books. I think being inclusive is important. But like you said, no one wants to be preached at or something put right in their face. It really does need to become more organic, um, which is a really good point. Um, we and have a question. Oh. I hate to raise this conversation, but I want to be very clear that if you're writing a book about a, uh, if it, that has a character that is a formerly or currently marginalized community, at the moment, be a member of that community. Just just do it. Don't, please, just make it easy on all of us so we don't have to explain to you over and over again why. Thank you. Yes, yeah. 
I think that's really important too, is that, and that's kind of what it is, is not so much just having literature about marginalized voices, but helping not have marginalized voices by actually working with authors in different communities and expanding. Um, I know, not to open a can of worms, but there was a very well-known white male author who recently said something about how it was hard out there for white guys right now to sell and uh, got a lot of backlash. But I think what it really is, is that it's just not it's not leaning that way right now, where it was for a really long time. The marketplace publishing is changing along with our, our world. And I think it's for the better. And I think we're going to continue to see that, which is a good thing. And it's not, it's not harder for cis white people to get published. It's just, there are, there, out of the 12 seats at the table, there's no longer 11 seats available to them now there's seven seats available to them. And so it's not harder. They still have the majority of the seats, I promise. Trust me, I've seen the numbers. They still have the majority of the seats. They just don't have 11 out of the 12. So, yeah. All right, question from Bobby. Um, Bobby is going to be doing a revised two books with re revised edition and one is new previously self published the two revised edition and Bobby is wondering if she should um, work towards getting an agent and a publisher for these two revised books in the new book or to continue self publishing. Uh, I know we've talked a little bit about this before, and you've actually written a blog for New Shelves about moving from self-published to published. Um, but if a book's already been out, can you just give us a really, you know, 10,000 foot overview of what would make that book that's already been out, if we're going for a second edition, what we might be looking for to encourage us to go one way or the other for a publisher yeah. just to keep with self-publishing? Yeah, I will try and keep this short because this is a topic that I'm passionate about and sometimes I go on. So Carrie, give me the high I'll sign. Stop, yeah. <laughs> I love self-published authors and, I, and half of the books I read are self-published and I love them. If, if your goal is to move to traditional publishing, then being a self-published author is going to be fine. It's going to be fine because one of two things is going to happen. Either you've sold 10, 15, 20,000 copies of your self-published book and the publishers are going to love you and they're going to want to sign your next book. Or you've sold 400 copies of your first book and you can tell an agent who will then pass on to the editors, I self-published, and this is the phrase that I use all the time, I was trying to learn my craft. I self-published so that I could learn about writing, I could polish my craft, I could get the my, my um, self as an author up to, to par, and now I'm ready for traditional publishing. That's how I phrase it. Because if you haven't sold 20, 10, 20,000 copies, the editors could say to themselves, this author doesn't sell a lot of books. And so I don't want to sign them because I need to only sign authors that I know are going to sell 10,000 copies minimum. And if, and so don't worry if you haven't sold 10,000 copies, a good agent knows how to get around that. Well, she was self-published. She didn't have the distribution. She didn't have the marketing. She didn't have any of that stuff. She did her best, but she, but by self-publishing, she learned a lot about the industry. She, she'll be a great partner in a, for a traditional publisher because she knows how it works and she's been polishing her craft. So here is the next book, not her old books. I don't know. I would never pitch uh, now and I'll get there. Your old books still have life. Hold on. But here is her next new book. And I am pitching this as a standalone novel. And you do not pitch the third book in a series to an editor or to an agent. No, you pitch a novel. Now, there happens to be other books in this universe, but this book that I want to have traditionally published is ready for a reader to read it alone. And if it's not, who Bobby or whoever asked this question, I need you to go back and revise. If you want to be traditionally published, you are not selling a series. You are certainly not selling book three of a series. You are selling a standalone novel with the potential of future series. So you pitched that third book as a standalone. Once you get a deal and then you sell 15,000 copies and oh my God, they want your next book. You can say, you know, it has a prequel. 
I have a prequel to that book. And then you rewrite it real quick. It was formally published. Then you can, then you can sell a formally published, self-published book. But if you have not sold 10, 15,000 copies, don't even bother trying. And, but if you haven't sold that many copies, feel free to be querying your next book as long as it's a standalone. And with that, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I think that's great. And I mean, we talked about that before. You definitely don't go in the middle and um, it, being self-published doesn't keep you from anything, but you do have to kind of know where you stand in the market and be honest with yourself. If you have done a Kindle free giveaway and you have given away 10,000 copies, that's not the same as selling 10,000 copies. I hear that a lot from self-published authors. Getting someone to download a free book is not the same as an actual sale where someone's willing to invest in your work. So I think that's important. And also don't inflate those numbers because there are ways for agents and editors to um, know that they can look at book scan. And also I've seen it for sure when talking about subsidiary rights and things like that, where they will ask for some sales proof, some proof of those sales and reports. So don't inflate those numbers. Mm -hmm. But uh, firstly, uh, for instance, Anna Vocino's Eat Happy Cookbook that I just sold to Ben Bella. Um, mm -hmm. Anna was a, self, a formerly self-published author and her book scan numbers say she sold like 12,000 copies of her last book. Well, she sold Lots. so much more than that. So much more than that. Not, if she didn't sell 15, she didn't sell 20. She sold so much more than that. I can't say how many. So all I did was I went to the, I asked her for the printer quantities because she sells most of her books direct. So mm -hmm. all I did was I said, look, here's an invoice for, um, uh, you know, for 50,000 copies that you printed. And here's another invoice for a reprint. Okay. They said, we're happy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love that because it's true. A lot of people, especially nonfiction, we see sell a lot of direct or back of house for events and things like that. Um, a question that we have that was emailed in, um, it's a little lengthy, so I'm going to read it. I've pitched several agents through various writing events and about five want to see my manuscript when I'm ready to submit it. It is finished and I'm working now with a woman who has been an agent to perfect my memoir. She also has a connection to an agent with whom it seems she will share my manuscript. How do I submit it to all of these agents in an appropriate, respectful fashion? So I think the question is, once you, if you have people who are all interested, but it's not finished, do you send it to them all at the same time? Do you send them yes. a full yes. manuscript? How yes. would you yes. suggest? Um, without fully understanding the entire situation, the caveat is with the information you've given me, this is my answer. Nobody gets it early. You get it ready, you get it polished, you, you have it development cleared. You know, there are, there are companies out there. I use them. I pay anywhere from $500 to $1,200 uh, to get my, all of my clients' books. I get it professionally reviewed by development editors, and I check for plot holes. And Because just because I see, I may have missed something. So kudos to you for working with a book coach. Kudos to you. But nobody gets to see it early polish it, get it ready, have it perfect, and then send it out to tons of people at the same time, you are, yes, you might get an agent who sees it early and agrees to take you on a client, but what if they're not the best agent for you? What if you could have gotten a better or bigger agent or one who's a better fit for you? Um, it's a little like dating. You don't settle for the first one. Um, however, you know, I know lots of people. My very first boyfriend is the man I'm married to now. It took 30 years to come back to it, but you know, um, you know, it happens. So my advice is get it ready and then query all the agents at the same time. That way, if there's interest from one agent, you then hit the other agents and say, I do have interest from an agent. I need to let you know. I would very much love to be considered by you. But I wanted to let you know that there's an offer coming. So you might want, I've signed a couple of clients who, who nudged me that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, perfect. Thank you. Um, a question. When sending in a book query, do you send in the copyright pages um, when they ask for the first 10 pages? So I think the question is, if you are sending in the first 10 pages for an agent, number one, do you include your copyright uh, page or should you just put a copyright on each page? And where do you start? Do you start with a prologue? Do you start with table of contents, the first chapter? What would you suggest? If it's a novel or a memoir, the answer is different. So a novel or a memoir, you start with chapter one. I don't even want to read the, pre the prologue. I think that 99% of the prologues out there are useless and lazy writing. I hate them. And a lot of people feel the same way. I'm not alone. So if the prologue is really important to your story, then include the prologue. But start with chapter one. If it's a memoir, do not include your introduction. No one cares why you wrote your book. Start with the beginning of the story. I'm sorry. I know I'm sounding mean, but that's my advice. Um, if it's nonfiction, then I definitely want to see the table of contents. I still don't want to see the intro. I don't care. Um, but if the foreword was written by Quincy Jones, yeah, include that. Um, yeah, so, um, so yes, my advice is different depending on the type of book. Definitely include, do not include your copyright page. That makes it look like your book was self-published. Uh, a publisher will, re will register the copyright on your behalf and your name when you get a publishing deal. There's no reason for you to have a copyright page when you're querying, um, you, uh, because a copyright page only happens when it's books published. So no. They, they know the book's yours. It's okay. This is the, you know, the industry is not stealing your idea. I promise. So that's right. my advice. And, yeah, that's great. And technically in the U.S. especially, once you write that book and it's down on paper, once it's written down, it is officially copyrighted. And of course, you're going to have electronic proof that you sent it there. And most people, and we've talked about this before, people have too much to lose to steal your work. Uh, it's not worth it. I'm not saying it never happens. There was actually uh, an instance, I think, last year where someone got caught, but they got caught and it definitely was career ruining. So it's not worth it for the vast majority of the industry to do anything with your It's your not work. worth it to pay someone $50, $80, $100 $100 to register your copyright. The publisher will do that. If you want to get traditionally published, it's not worth it. If you're publishing the book yourself, it's a very different answer. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, what are your opinions on genre blends? Love them, love them, love them. But you have to be able to spot what it is. And so I'm going to give you an answer. My book is half sci-fi, half cookbook. That's not going to work. That's not going to work. Um, now, I've got a sci-fi novel that the main character is a chef. And there's a couple really cool recipes in there on top of everything else that if people actually tried to make them, um, they'd actually be delicious. Well, that I can sell. I'm, um, as I said before, rom-com with a touch of magic or speculative is very hot right now. Crossover books, extremely hot. But crossover is not the same thing as I don't feel like writing a book that follows the rules of commercial fiction, but I want to sell this book as commercial fiction. No, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to say my book is half thriller, half sci-fi. It can be a sci-fi mystery, but it's a sci-fi book that has a mystery element. This is a thriller book that has a political element. This is a, until the, the, the blend, political thriller used to not be a phrase. There mm -hmm. were just mysteries. And then we broke off into thriller and eventually enough thrillers were written with political themes that political thriller became a subgenre. If you want to be part of a movement to create a subgenre, I love that. But make sure that that you stay within the rules of the genre because if the subgenre doesn't exist, then um, that may be the unique selling point that you need. I love it but make sure you're still following the rules of craft. Does that make sense? Yes. I think that makes perfect sense. And you really do have to, you kind of have to be rooted in one or the other um, or else, I mean, people often say, well, this has never been done before. And that may be true, but usually not. Or if it's never ever been done before, 
maybe there's a reason why it's never been done before. You've never heard of it. Um, the question specifically, they were asking about why a fantasy and crime. Do you think that's a pairing that could work? Yes. Yes, I think a YA fantasy with a mystery element or because why a mystery isn't really a thing. I mm -hmm. kind of like that because there's so much YA fantasy right now. It is so competitive. So pitching yourself as a YA mystery with a touch of sci-fi or a touch of speculative, but I don't know what the book is. This book may actually take place on, on you know, a completely alternate universe with with everyone, uh, the, uh, with creatures that are covered in gold lame skin. Uh, and so that that's not a mystery book with sci-fi elements. It's a sci-fi, you know, it's a fantasy book. Um, not knowing the book, I like the idea, but make sure, make sure that you're grounded because it's called a subgenre for a reason, a subgenre for a reason. Oh, yeah. Bob is making a very good point. Uh, good point, Bob, he just said, that publishers, I'm gonna, I'm gonna broaden his point, don't want the dilemma of trying to explain the book or figure out where to shelve it. And while that's absolutely true, it's changing. It's changing. You asked me earlier, Carrie, what the what some of the things were I was seeing in the future. I am seeing a loosening up of a willingness to take on books that don't fit on the shelf. However, they still do. They still do. Bob's books will, for at least the ones I know, they fit in humor. Should they also go in the pet section? Probably, because he does. he's got a humor book about cats. But, but his books are in humor. So as long as you know what bookshelf it sits on and you can make the argument that it's a twist on an existing shelf, I love it. Yeah, and I do think that you do need to know what shelf and what audience it's for. I, I have worked with someone recently who keeps saying that their book is for one audience, but the book actually targets a different audience. So I think it's important that you know who your reader is, whether you're self-publishing or traditional publishing, you do have to have an idea of who you're writing for, because then as Amy has said, you have to follow kind of the rules of that specific uh, genre. And there are expectations. If your book is mainly crime, then there are kind of some expectations of what's going to be in that book. If it's a cozy mystery versus a thriller, there are expectations and you need to know what your reader is wanting to have or else you're going to have a really hard time selling a book if it's, if it's too outside the lines or if you don't have that main genre and category and you know that for both pitching for agents and publishers, but also for just direct marketing as well. And those expectations are not unreasonable. The reader is allowed, I mean, they are putting down their money and they're not only giving you their money, they're giving you their time. They're giving you six, seven, eight hours of their time and they want to be entertained or comforted or thrilled or horrified, but they, they, they come with expectations and they're allowed to have them. Get, I have authors who get angry that readers won't accept their brilliance because they're going against the grain, and that's fine. But that's a really small group of people. There's all, truthfully, there's only a small group of people that really love jazz. I mean, I got to tell you, jazz musicians, absolutely brilliant. Um, are there jazz fests? Yes. But you know what? Rock and roll is still king. Um, you know, if you want to be brilliant, and, and then you'll get a small audience that will appreciate your brilliance. But publishers aren't in the business of publishing to small niche guys, uh, you know, niche groups. Um, so, yeah, they're mm -hmm. allowed, readers are allowed to have those expectations. If you've written a murder, there'd better be a body in the first few pages. Absolutely. And if, if you don't meet those expectations, you're going to get slaughtered in the reviews. So they will also let you know, and that is their right. Not everyone who reads your book is going to love it. But if you really don't meet those expectations, then they don't hold back, um, especially for some diehard genres like murder mystery, romance, certain things like that. They, they'll let you know. Um, a question here is about what is one of the biggest turnoffs on a pitch letter to an agent? <laughs> just right. a couple, Amy, just a couple. All right. Dear agent. Oh, my God. Dear agent is one of my biggest. 
guys, um, I know that, that, that you can buy databases and you can, you can even mail it out with MailChimp. I get it. Personalize, personalize your, your query. Find, tell me why you're querying me. You know, I saw you on Free Advice Friday and you made a joke about, you know, plucky heroines fighting the Nazis, uh, but you also like a twist. Here's a twist. Um, or personal, I saw MSLW, I, you know, I went on manuscript wish list and I see that you're looking for LGBTQ characters that write middle grade. I thought I'd be personalize the opening. That's my number one. Number two, no other books out there like this. I, I don't have any comps. No, 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 no. Of course you do. Your readers are, whoever is going to be reading your book is clearly reading other books right now. Readers read voraciously. What are your readers reading right now? Tell me that. I need to know, and I need to know that in your pitch. And um, I know it's not fair. And I know that your book is unique. And I know that nobody wants to to dig in and take the time and energy to look up comps. Well, then if you're not willing to do the work, I'm not willing to take you on as a client. I need a client who clearly is willing to personalize. Uh, you know, is willing to take the extra step. Um, any query, any query that um, gives me that just goes on and on and on with a plot. I don't need the plot. What I need, I don't need the plot. I need an overview, a quick overview of what your book's about. And when I say, what is your book about? I'm not asking for the plot. You know, um, you know, the book is about cowboys in space. The book is about, yeah. so keep it short, personalize your attention, make sure you know the industry and you you know what your readers are reading and tell me you know the industry by dropping in some comps that make sense. Um, I have a million more, um, but those are the ones that came to, to the head right away. Yeah, the big one. Um, and this kind of ties in a little bit. How soon is too soon to follow up? Uh, anything after um, 60 days is good. 60 days. Some agents will ask for 90 days. Um, but I, uh, I have to tell you when, when I'm open to queries, um, when I'm open to queries, if you haven't heard back from me in 60 days, something's gone a little off, something's gone wrong. So, um, now once you've heard back from me and I've asked for a full manuscript, then I need 90 days or more. I mean, it, cause I, you know, it takes a while to read a book and I actually have to spend my day working for my existing clients. But, um, but hearing back from a query, you'd better have heard, heard back from me um, within a month, but 60 days at the outside. I'd be following up within 60 days. Perfect. Um, and speaking of being closed or open to queries, how do you feel about people who query even if they know you're closed to queries? It immediately gets thrown out. I don't respond and I get angry. Um, I ask people all the time to query me when I'm closed, all the time. I see people on Twitter, I like their style, and I'll, I'll slip into their DMs and say, hey, would you be willing to send me some information about your book? Or I'll meet them at conference. Even though I'm closed to queries, I am reviewing 20 or 30 queries every week. And that's just when I'm closed to queries. When I'm open, I'm, I'm, having, I, I'm getting three or 400 a week. So... Mm -hmm. But even though I'm close to queries, trust me, I will ask if I want to know about your book. So if I meet you and I, and I don't ask to see something, it means that I want to be your friend at the moment. And I'm not open to queries. Um, and if I haven't met you and you just email me anyway, oh my gosh, I will be lighting a candle for your soul because clearly, clearly there's a special realm in hell for you. My inbox is full enough. Thank you. Uh, love it. And I've heard that from a lot of agents, like some of them feel bad, but it gets tossed out, deleted and, and agents also talk, they talk and tell each other about that kind of thing too. So, uh, I think the best advice is just not to do it. One but of I my think email responses that I, I got, there's a woman, I'm not going to say her name. She has on her, on the bottom of her email, you know, her name, her phone number, you know, her, her signature. And it says, any unsol any email sent to me unsolicited or by someone I do not know um, will be deleted. She 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 just puts it out there. I love it. I know who you're talking about too, and I love it. <laughs> um, I think that's great. How how long or how short should a query letter be? 
it depends on the book and it depends on the relationship between you and your agent that you're querying. So I hate to, to, to do this. It's going to be another long answer. If you don't know me and you're querying me blind, short, 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 um, grab my attention with, with something that will make me want to ask more. But if I don't know you and I'm scrolling, scrolling, I stopped reading. I've stopped reading. Tell me a little bit about your book. Tell me why you'd be a great client and ask if I'd like to know more. It's the start of a conversation, guys. Your query letter is not your entire PhD thesis. It's not your, it's not everything, you know, it's not your book. It's the start of a conversation. So think of it that way. Now, if, if you're going to query manager, which a lot I use and a lot of agents use, they will ask you for things and they will tell you how many words they want. So you don't even, I love query manager. You don't even have to guess. If you are querying me warm, I've met you at a conference, perhaps I've asked for something. Um, we hit it off uh, on an airplane and I told you I was an agent and I didn't ask for anything, but but you decide to, to query me because we hit it off on the plane. Well, of course you can go longer. But here's the rule. At a cocktail party, if someone doesn't ask you, would you still tell them stuff? So a query letter, you're just supposed to answer the question that's being asked, which is, why would I want you as a client? Keep it short, very short. And I think, I mean, Amy and my emails to each other, and we, we are very close. Those are short because who wants to spend all day reading emails, regardless of how well you know somebody. And if you are going too long, it comes across often as justifying rather than uh, presenting a, a good offer and a fun deal. It sounds like justifying rather than um, what you probably hope it is, which is hooking in your reader for you an email. Can me in a couple of sentences and get me intrigued in four or five sentences, then the book's not ready or your pitch isn't ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, speaking of conferences, a lot of conferences actually like will sell tickets for a slot to pitch agents. Do you think that's effective? Is that something that is a good way to get in front of agents? Or is it something that you feel is more um, maybe not as beneficial because it's a paid spot? It's definitely beneficial. It definitely helps. I have signed more clients from conferences than I have from queries. Blind queries, I have almost no cl clients, but people I've met at conferences are two thirds of my list. But most, not all, but a lot of the conferences that sell spots to query agents are, they're not, they're not my favorite. I, I don't actually, I, if you see me at a conference and I'm taking pitches, that is an age, that is a conference that does it right. I'm, I, I, I don't know how to say, I'm just going to say it. Some of them are money grabs. Some of them are not legit. I'm just going to say, it. I'm not going to say who, but some of them are just a way to separate you from your money. A lot of them. Legitimate conferences that, um, that have what they call blue pencil sessions or pitch sessions as part of your conference fee are my favorite. Those are the best. And those that, um, those that do charge, it's a small fee. It's $20. It's, you know, it's little. It's, it's $25. I mean, if, you're, if they're charging you $125 to pitch an agent, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't. Something's off. That's just me. That's just my opinion. Um, I yeah. agree. And do you think if someone is going to sign up for one of those, do you think that typically it's not just an agent, usually there's a name associated. Do you think that they should research and see if that agent is actually even taking their genre? Um, should they do research on the agent ahead of time or does should they just go in and just give a pitch? Well, if they get to choose the agent, some of them you don't, some of them you're just assigned. Um, yes, you should do the research ahead of time. In most cases, that's, that's, you don't have the option for that. So you know what I would do and what people, what I often, people will sit down and they'll pitch me a memoir. I don't sell memoir for the most part. Have I sold a memoir? Yes, but you know, it's rare. So I don't take memoir. I don't want memoir, but 
I can use that 15 minutes as a coaching session to help you improve your pitch, to improve your chances of getting a publishing deal. And, and so if someone sits down and they're not a great fit, because some of the conferences don't allow you to, you know, you, you get what you get. Um, don't, don't be afraid to ask the agent and say, okay, so what genres are you interested in? Oh, I'm not one of those. Is there any chance I can give you a pitch? I'd love your feedback on my pitch and use it as a coaching session. That would be worth the 20, 25 bucks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a pretty, that's cheap consulting. Um, as far as for those who are either do have agents or have been published traditionally, um, what does the agent author relationship typically look like after a book has been sold to a publisher? Do you still keep in touch? How does that work? <laughs> well, I can't speak for all agents, but I am incredible. I'm a busybody. Um, I can't speak for all agents, but uh, after a book has been sold, I'm in on the marketing meetings. I am, I am always on the phone and on emails asking, can we have a meeting with the sales department? I want to know what the plans are for the library market. Uh, what page of the catalog are you on? My job is if my client is on page 42 of the catalog, I will actually ask, I will push to have it move closer to the front of the catalog. Um, my job as an agent is, is to manage my client's business. Now, not all, a lot of agents don't do this. Here's another thing. I don't edit. A lot of my fellow agents will edit their client's manuscripts, but it would never occur to them to fight to have their book on an earlier page of the catalog. Every agent has a different focus. Mine is a little more sales and marketing focus. So I absolutely am a business advocate for my clients. And after the book is published, I'm checking book scan numbers. I'm suggesting that uh, we do book bubs. I'm actually offering to pay for book bubs. I mean, I've gone that far. I have, um, Carrie, have I not, you know, called you and, and, and hired you and asked you, I've consulted with Carrie uh, because I don't know what's happening with this book and I want my clients to get, so I hired Carrie and I paid for an hour of her consulting time so that my clients can get some marketing help. Um, they don't pay, I mean, that's, yes, I'm completely involved. Mm -hmm. I can't speak for other agents, but that's me. Right. Well, because agents also, it is a long-term partnership very often. And I mean, I think we all know by now that even if you are traditionally published, the author still has to market their book. More and more, they are taking on the responsibility of marketing and social media and things like that. So that is an ongoing thing. And it, that's probably also, I would imagine something you kind of look for in a client is someone who's willing to help market themselves because that would help the success of the book. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's a big reason why ageism is such a problem in our industry. I just signed a client this week who is in his seventies. Um, he hasn't, he's so talented. He's so talented, but he hasn't been able to get an agent. And I know why. And I'm just going to be blunt because my, I'm about to invest thousands of dollars in this guy. And what if he only has one book in him? I better make sure that this book is going to get me my money back um, because this is a business I'm in. And you're, I'm far more likely to sign somebody who I know has five books in them. If somebody has spent 20 years writing their book, it doesn't even matter how old they are. They have one book and they've been writing it since 1998. That is not of interest to me. That means they don't have another book in them for another 20 years. I need a book a year. I need, you, I need you moving because this is a business and I want to, I want our relationship to, I want you to be able to quit your day job and I want to be able to retire in Barcelona. And for that to happen, we need product. I'm sorry to be so crass. So yeah. Yeah. It's uh, well, it's business. It's and business. yeah. Yeah. Um, one last question. And that is in regards to, um, Sorry, I was reading. Um, the last question here is about if you do have an agent, how long typically does it take to sell something? And when is it time to break up with your agent? That's a hard one. It is because I don't know. 
The answer is I don't know. I've got a couple clients now that if I was a stronger person, I would release them into the wild because I've just not done a great job for them. But once I've released them into the wild, they don't have any agent. And, and then they're on their own. I mean, they're like little baby deer running off in the wild without any protection. And at least, you know, at least I'm a big, scary mama who can keep them, but I'm not selling their, especially some of the people I signed at the beginning of my agent career. I, I didn't know that their book wasn't really going to work, but I know that now. And so I hire editors and they get a 15 page, um, you know, report on what they can do to improve their manuscript. And if they do, absolutely. Then I'm, you know, but if they don't, um, so if, if I haven't sold the project in two years, uh, which is what I'm coming up with now for some of my clients, I then start the conversation. What's your next book? What are you working on? How's your, I mean, I start the conversation before two years, trust me, but I want to know what their next book is. Um, most of my clients, I've sold projects, but the ones that I haven't, I, after 80, 90 pitches, I'm done. I'm, I mean, I just, I can't. And can I start pitching them to small publishers that won't give them an advance? Sure. Um, but I, I'm more interested on their next, their next book, because clearly this book is not, if 87 publishers say no, thank you, then probably 87% of the readers are going to say the same thing. I don't know that for sure, but I would never fire a client, but I can understand why they'd want to leave me. And after two years, I want to be selling something else. Yeah. So I think what I'm hearing kind of is that if you are ready to walk away from your agent, chances are your agent is also okay with that separation at that time. So sometimes it's okay to mutually walk away, I think. Um, and, and we're coming to start the conversation early. Don't be afraid to talk about your frustrations right from the beginning. I have a couple of clients who are, who got very frustrated with me really early in our relationship because my communication style did not fit what made them comfortable. They wanted, you know, much more frequent updates. They want, and, and they're allowed to want those things. Those are reasonable, but I wasn't doing it. So they came to me, they said, Amy, this isn't working for me. And I said, okay, I'll change. And I did. And, and if I wasn't willing to or capable of changing my communication style, then we should have parted. But I made, I made a decision that their request was very reasonable. I didn't like it. I don't want to write a weekly report. I'm lazy. Uh, but sure, for them, I would do it. And if I, if I wasn't going to, then, then we should have parted friends. But don't wait until you're so frustrated and angry that things are going to blow up. This is, you know, this is, this is not a marriage. Just, just talk about it. Come on. <laughs> Even in a marriage, you probably should just talk about it. Um, and I love that. So we want to respect your time, but everyone wants to know, number one, are you open or close to queries? And either way, what are you typically repping these days? I am close to queries at the moment because I have, I am onboarding a whole bunch of new clients and to be fair to them, I have to get, I, I financially, I mean, it's, I'm, it's going to be a $20,000 a month for me just paying for editors. Um, and time-wise I have to get them ready. I have to launch them. So I'm close to queries at the moment, not because I'm too busy, but because I'm in a phase where I'm launching a whole bunch of my babies and I want my babies to all be very successful in a couple months, they're all going to be launched and I'll be open to queries again, probably October, November. Um, I will open up again. Everyone will be launched. I'll be, everyone will be pitched and it is what it is. I will have launched them out into the world. I'll still have my eye on them, but I'll be ready to take on a new, a new group of babies. Um, what I am focusing on the most right now is I'm having most luck with nonfiction. I, um, I, I am signing a lot of books of uh, like books of inspirational essays. Um, I don't do memoir, as I said, but a lot of the books that I've sold recently are based on true stories. You know what I mean? They're kind of like, um, Devery Donaldson's book. Um, I just signed Lewis Mitchell. He's the executive director of Sesame street. Um, and they've got books of advice, advice books I'm doing a, very well with, um, uh, cookbooks I'm looking for. If you've got an interesting cookbook, I'd love to see it. I do sci-fi when it comes to fiction. I'm all about sci-fi fantasy. Um, I've sold a lot of those. Um, uh, 
uh, yeah. So uh, who am I interested in? I'm interested in New York Times bestselling authors who already have a six-figure offer from a publisher, but they need an agent to help them negotiate it. And in lieu of that, if you're not one of those, um, I'm looking for someone who I personally love to talk to. I'm looking for, I mean, one of the reasons, I mean, Bob Eckstein is not a client and, and he would never want me to be my client, but I adore talking to him. So, um, so I've actually approached him in the past and I've said, I've had an idea. Let's work on a book project together. Um, I want people I like, and that's tough to tell, but you know, when you resonate with someone. So I have, I recently signed a YA project and I hate children. I don't like them. I don't want to talk to him, but I loved this author so much. And I loved her writing so much that I knew I could work with her and I knew I could get her a deal. So it, it all worked out great. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time. It was good to have you back. All the comments on the side are that it's good to have you back and you're fabulous, which we already knew. So thank you so much. Anyone who is looking to connect with Amy, you can reach her at amysadvice.com. She's also on Twitter. She's on Facebook. You can find her on Instagram. She's everywhere because she's my, famous. My social media handle is Ask Amy Collins. And I would love to, uh, and especially if you're a TikToker, make sure that you slide into my DMs and, and so that I can friend you on TikTok. Yes. And then make funny videos because she sends them to me and I'll enjoy them as well. <laughs> All right, you guys, it was so <laughs> fantastic being here this weekend. Thank you for joining us. We will be back to our regular program next Friday, 10 a.m. Eastern. So if you have questions about book marketing or publishing that didn't get answered today, feel free to join us again next week, just at newshelf.com slash FAF. Or you can email in your questions and we'll answer them next week. It's info, I-N-F-O at newshelves.com. And our replay will go up on YouTube on Monday. And that's simply New Shelves Books on YouTube. So you can catch it there. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Amy. And we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody. <laughs>